All right. Well, this morning we are going to be concluding our series in Ephesians. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. Ephesians chapter 6. The sermon title is called The Last of the Ephesians. It's kind of got a double meaning there as we think about this. One is the last sermon in the book of Ephesians, but two, there's kind of a challenge that we're going to put out here today. A challenge for us as a church, a challenge for us as specific people right here in St. Paul to sit and think about, are we going to live as if we were the last of the Ephesians? Are we going to choose to live our lives in that way? And the sermon idea, if you want to follow along, there's an outline in your bulletin, kind of a fill-in-the-blank outline that might help you to track with today's message, give you some pointers. Um, but the idea of the sermon is this, is that we're at war against Satan. And those of you who have been Christians for more than five minutes, you understand the fact that we're at war, right? We feel that. You may not know exactly what it looks like, but life has problems, doesn't it? It does. Life isn't easy. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that all your problems go away. They don't. So there's this war, this constant battle going on. So we're at war against Satan. And in the last part of Ephesians, Paul gives a final battle cry for the church at Ephesus. This cry is to be strong. This cry to be strong is a timeless call, valid for us even today. So, what is your answer? As we hear about this cry, as we hear about this call, what is your answer? What's your answer going to be? Will you stand with the Ephesians for the sake of Christ? Will that be your answer? Now, there's a book out there called The Last of the Mohicans. Apparently, they made a movie out of it back in the 90s. I never saw the movie. But that book, it's an interesting book, The Last of the Mohicans, in it. And there's a quote I'm going to take out of that. And I'm ahead of myself again. Wretched. Let's move on. And then I'll come back to the quote, okay? So give me just a second here, all right? As we digress back and I retrain my thoughts, focus. Is the, is the force with me today? Somebody, somebody cry out for the force. Is it May 4? It's Friday. May the 4th be with you. Okay. All right. Pastor Bear is going to make it today. Here we are. Ephesians. Review. Review of Ephesians. So we're going to do a little bit of review here briefly before we get into the basis of the sermon. So the review is this. One of Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 talk about our position. Our new position in Christ. We're chosen by Christ. We have this new position. And every blessing is ours through Christ. This is a position. Because of what Christ has done, every blessing is available to us. So if you're a believer, you have this position, this new position available to you, okay? We're saved through grace. We get that position through salvation, which is available to us by grace, through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, all right? So we understand these things. We understand that it takes our faith that God is a gracious God, and that by believing in God, we can have salvation. So my position is every blessing is available through Christ if, if I want, if I have faith in Christ. That's my position. And through that position, then I become unified in Christ. I become unified not just with the body of Christ spiritually, but also with all of you guys as the body of Christ. We become united as one. So we are one very eclectic, twisted family. I've met some of you guys out here. And you've met me and you say, Pastor, what is wrong with you? We know this, right? We talk about the crazy uncles that every family has. And we have a few of those here. This is what happens when you bring together broken people. But it's awesome, isn't it? Because our church potlucks and our gathering times, we, we get together and we laugh because we're all unique, but we're all unified. That's the position that we have in Christ. Now that position then, what it does is that challenges our condition. Because what it should do is it should change our condition. We were born dead in sins, okay? So now that we have this new life in Christ, our condition here on earth, there should be a change in that condition. Not required, but there should be. So our condition then is challenged. Where Paul says, therefore I urge you to walk in a manner worthy. That begins chapter 4. Alright, so 1 through 3 is our position. 4 through 6 is our condition. So let's look at this. So he wants us to change our walk. The way we live our lives, Paul wants us to change our walk. He wants us to imitate God. We need to, in our imitation of God, what do we do? Well, we love each other, which sometimes is easier than other times, right? Those of you who are married, you know this, right? We've got to forgive one another. We've got to submit to one another. We looked at this from the aspect of husbands and wives, from children and fathers, bosses, employees, slaves, all these different things. We looked at that because Paul addressed all of those issues. What does that look like? How do we do that? Well, in all of those, we have to love, we have to forgive, we have to submit to one another. This whole submission thing is tough. The whole submission thing is tough because it's one of those, if we are willing to do that, if we are willing 
to choose to love somebody more than we love ourselves, if we're willing to, cho to choose to forgive somebody regardless of what they do, if we're willing to submit to someone else regardless, then that helps us become unified. But that whole thing is just foreign to us. And I mentioned the book, The Last of Mohicans. There's a phrase in there that I wanted to quote from you, for you guys. is this. Hawkeye in that book, he says, I do not call myself subject to much at all. So the setting of the book is Revolutionary War, right? Is the setting of this when it was written, The Last of Mohicans. And so it's one of those, and he's, he's being challenged by a soldier, say, hey, why aren't you fighting? And he says, I do not consider myself subject to much at all. I don't really want to put myself under anybody's authority. Well, unfortunately here at the church, that's not the way it's supposed to be, and that's really not the cry of Paul in Ephesians. Because Paul says, we are all in submission, Husbands, men, you're in submission to Christ as Christ is in submission to God the Father. And so men, as we respond to Christ, right, then our wives respond to us and then our children also respond to us. And what is it? Well, men are kind of the linchpin for the whole thing. We're kind of that kingpin there. If we fail, then it becomes harder for our wives to choose to do what they want to do. It's harder for our children to choose to do what they want to do. So men, a lot of it falls on us, this whole submission thing. But in this whole church... Basically, it's one of those things, as the leadership goes, so goes the church, right? As the family leadership goes, so goes the family. There's a lot of wisdom to that. You see that in companies. As a boss is, oftentimes, so is the company. Now, you can surround yourself with capable people who do some amazing things, but you can also see companies who fail because of leaders who are not leading, who are not leading well. We are to be in submission to one another. Now, that was just a little bit of a review. So God gives the final challenge, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. I like that word, finally. It's kind of the culmination of this whole book as I look at it. This culmination, finally, finally, everything I've talked about, your new position, your condition, how you're supposed to live, the different things you're supposed to do, finally be strong in the Lord. And that's his last cry, be strong in the Lord. Why would he say be strong in the Lord? Except for the fact, we are at war, people. Here's the thing, we're at war. And he goes on to describe this. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. We are at war. And everybody here in this room can identify that, identify with that. We all have battles that we're facing. Some are facing battles today. Some, it's sometimes just this little discouragement. Sometimes it's, you're like me up here, I'm just a little bit rattled this morning, obviously, for whatever reason. So my thoughts are scattered. These things happen. This is life. We are at war. I want to take a moment. I just want to pray with you guys as a congregation as we address this battle, as we address the things. And I want to pray God's wisdom on all of us as we th and think about our lives and God help us as we evaluate. Father, we're, we're coming to you today. Lord, we need your wisdom. We need your peace. We are examining our lives and looking at the fact that we are at war. And we may not even realize it. Some of us may not realize it. God, I help us. I pray that you would help us. I ask that you would help us as we look to see where we are being attacked and as we learn what pieces of armor we can put on to deal with these attacks. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the armor of God is one of those things that we preached about. You know, you hear sermons on all the time. Well, not all the time, but frequently. Most of us have probably heard sermons on the armor of God. The kids are going to come up here. They're going to sing about it here in just a little bit. There are songs written about the armor of God. And I've heard messages. I had a guy, there was a guy in our church that was a blacksmith back at home, and he actually made a full armor that he would wear. It was pretty awesome. But I want to address this a little bit differently today. Instead of going down the pieces of armor and then just describing those pieces, what I want to do is I want to start with the idea of what are some of the battles we face. What are some of the battles we face in a, as a Christian, as a believer? And then as we face these battles, what pieces of armor do I need to put on to better address those battles? The first battle I want to talk about is this battle, am I really saved? And I sit here and, and I'm telling you, a lot of these battles I'm sharing with you guys today are battles that I personally have faced. This is one I faced when I was in elementary school. Am I really saved? That's a battle. 
That's a battle maybe some of you here are wondering. Am I really saved? If I die today, am I going to heaven? How do I know? What happens if I die today? You may have that battle right now that you're wondering. You know, if this isn't all there is to life, if there's something more, what happens to me when I pass over the other side? What happens? Am I going to heaven? That is a real question. That is a real battle that many of us struggle with. Paul answered that earlier in Ephesians but I like what he says here. He says in verse 13, chapter 6, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, and may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all, stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. If you're facing this battle, am I really saved? I would ask you to look at what the Bible has to say. I would ask you to examine the truth. What is the truth about this? Well, Ephesians says this, in him you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And what does that mean, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit? Well, I shortened that so to be room on the screen. I'm going to read the full thing. In him you also, that refers to Christ, in Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth, did you catch that? The word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The Bible says... If you have believed in Christ, then you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So if you ask this question, am I really saved? I'm going to ask you this question in return. I'm going to say, have you believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Have you believed that Jesus came to this earth to die for your sins? Have you believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Because if you believe those things, then you are sealed, and that is an irrevocable decision. And you say, well, pastor, what if I believed earlier and now I'm not so sure, now I doubt? Well, 2 Timothy addresses that for us. 2 Timothy says, even when we are, the word is opistus, meaning without faith, just like amorals, without morals, opistus, without faith. Even, with we, even when we are without faith, he is faithful because he cannot deny himself. So in those moments in our lives when we are just faithless and we say, God, I don't even know if it's true, Jesus says, he says, look, you are part of my body and I'm not going to deny you. That's an irrevocable decision. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You can't get out of it. That's the belt of truth. If this is a battle you're going through, am I really saved? Trust me. The truth says if you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, then you are saved. That's it. How about this battle? I'm not good enough. Man, that's one, right? Sometimes we wonder about that. God, I'm, I'm just not good enough. There's things that maybe you want me to do it, but God, I don't feel like I can. I'm not good enough to do whatever. God, I don't, you can't use me. I'm a broken person. Absolutely. We have those, don't we? What's he say? What's the next piece of armor we're going to put on? Ephesians chapter 6. We talk about the belt of truth. So what's next? The breastplate of righteousness, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now here's something to think about. This breastplate of righteousness, this isn't anything to do with our salvation because salvation is something you put on and put off. We'll talk about this later with the helmet of salvation. It's not something you put on and put off again. This breastplate of righteousness, what is that? Well, let's examine this for just a moment, okay? Ephesians 1, 7. Okay, a little review here in Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. So we look at Ephesians, the very first part of Ephesians, where we have forgiveness, we have redemption, all that's been settled, it's been taken care of. My salvation is not called into question. So when I'm putting on this righteousness, that has nothing to do with my salvation, putting it on, putting it off, has nothing to do with that. What does it have to do with? Well, Ephesians 4. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Here's the thing. We can choose to live as broken people. We can choose to live the old condition. But God says, look, you have the potential to be every bit as good as I can make you which is perfectly righteous. In Romans chapter 8, he says he wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. Conformed to the image of his son. That's something all of us can work on. You sit there and think, I'm not good enough, and God says, yet. But I can help you with it. Do not doubt that you can, I'm trying to make sure I phrase this correctly, never doubt, never, ever, ever doubt that God cannot use you. And never, ever, ever doubt that God cannot grow you past where you are right now. If you think I'm not good enough, and God's still calling you to do something, then God thinks you're good enough. And God says, I can grow you into my righteousness. 
Will you put on that breastplate of righteousness? Will you recognize that God in you is working? 2 Corinthians 5 I'm just going to back up for just a moment here and read that 2 Corinthians 5 passage talking about Christ and His gift and His sacrifice for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Again, that's not a salvation. It's not something that you're slowly becoming more and more saved. No, it's slowly becoming more and more like Christ. If you think, you know what, Pastor, I'm just not good enough. That maybe you may feel that right now, but God can grow you. Do not feel like you're stuck. This is a battle. Many of us face this battle. And so because of that, we get frozen. We don't do anything. God says, look, stand up, put on that breastplate of righteousness, recognize that I'm there, and I can grow you. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. How about this? No one loves me. Answer, put on the gospel of peace. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. The whole idea of no one loves me, we had that battle. There are many of us that face that battle. Say, God, I don't think anybody here loves me. I don't think anybody cares for me. I don't think anybody understands what I'm going through. You may think that, but the reality is that people do. And so what's he say? Put on that gospel of peace. Verse 15, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is this. This is the gospel that a God rich in mercy because of his great love did what? Made us alive together with Christ. He sent his son Jesus to die for us. You want to talk about love? I can't think of a greater love than that. Than what? A man lays down his life for his friends. That's what love is. And that's exactly what God has done. You say, well, okay, God's just a spiritual being in the sky. I can't really see him. I can't experience that. Well, then you're not part of a church family if you're feeling that you're not loved because a church family does this. A good church family, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. We are a very eclectic group of people. But I've got to tell you, we are a very loving group of people as well. There is some great love here. And if you ever wonder if you're feeling loved, I can give you a bunch of phone numbers, buddy. All you got to do is call them. Hopefully the church office is one of those on your list. Because I got to tell you, there is a lot of love in this room. And there are times this is a battle. But the gospel of peace is a gospel of a God that loves, uniting us in love. That's exactly what God does. If this is a battle you're facing, I'm telling you guys, pick up that. Put those shoes on. Pick up that piece of armor and put those shoes on and this is what you got to do because the gospel itself is a gospel of love. Bringing all of us into that unity of love. How about this? If God loves me, why do I hurt? That's a real one. If God is love, why do I hurt? You ever felt that before? I have. Say, God, I don't understand what you're doing. Why, why would you do this? God, you're supposed to be a good God and yet this world is full of this. What in the world's going on? Well, what's that next piece? In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Here's the thing with the shield of faith. I've never in my life had to grow in my faith in easy times. I've never had to grow in my faith in easy times. And so in our lives, when we're going through those hard times, that shield of faith is exactly what we need. When we're asking those questions, if God is love, why do I hurt? God tells us, pick up that shield of faith, people. Pick it up. Ephesians 3, 11 through 13 says this. This was according to the eternal purpose that he's realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is Paul writing the church. And he says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Recognize he talks about faith. He said, look, because of our faith, we have confidence. All right, and so what? So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering. You see that suffering in there? Our faith causes us not to lose heart over suffering. First Peter says this, First Peter 5, 8 9, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. I gotta tell you, people, faith is never tested in easy times. It just isn't. 
If you're asking that question, if God is love, why do I hurt? I'm going to challenge you to pick up that shield of faith. So you know what, God? This world is full of sinners. And we can make a difference. We can. People make choices all the time that have consequences. We do that. And that's just a reality of the world that we live in. But it doesn't change who God is. It does not change who God is. And you're sitting here wondering, you know what, Pastor? You don't know what I'm going through. You don't see the hurts. Yeah, but I know the God. I know the God who created this world. Will you choose to pick up that shield of faith? Will you choose to stay strong? Job says that man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job chapter 5, we know that. That troubles are going to be rampant throughout this world. 1 Corinthians 7, my favorite verse I love to share with married couples. If you get married, you have not sinned, but you will have trouble. Right? We know that. Troubles are going to come. But we cannot lose faith in the middle of that. How about this battle? Is there any help for me in my problems? Here's one. You know what? It's amazing how many of these Christians, we just struggle. There may be some character flaw that we've had that's been pointed out to us that we just can't figure out how to get our mind past. There may be some addiction that we're struggling with that we just can't seem to kick and we just wonder, Pastor, God can't use me. I'm so messed up. I don't understand what to do. I can't get past this. And if you're there, I'm going to tell you this. Take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. You sit there and think, what's the helmet of salvation have to do with that? Well, here's the thing. When you see the word saved in the Bible, we should always ask, saved from what? Because the word saved literally means what? It means delivered. It's another synonym for delivered. So delivered from what exactly? When, first, when, when Peter, the apostle, was walking on the water, and he took his eyes off of Jesus and began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Was he praying for eternal life at that moment? No. He was praying, God, deliver me. I'm about to drown. There are times in our lives when we are about to drown, and we're praying out, God, deliver me. And there are problems all of us face where we need to cry out to God to deliver us. Deliver me. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And I love that first part. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. We have a God who can deliver us from anything. Absolutely anything. You say, well, why doesn't he? Well, sometimes he wants us to grow. Sometimes he wants to test us. There are many different reasons, but does that change who he is? I'm going to back up for just a moment to Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was the story of when Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, had built this golden statue and requiring everybody to bow down to this statue, to worship this statue. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three men of God, refused to do it because worshiping a false idol. The king told them, said, look, if you do not bow down, I will throw you in the fiery furnace. You will die. Now, will you bow down or not? And their response was this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver, catch that, to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. These were men who knew they were facing a problem, and they knew God could deliver them, but they said, even if he doesn't, we are not changing our faith. We are not changing who we are trusting in. We are taking up that hell of salvation, trusting God to deliver us, but if he doesn't, it doesn't change God at all. And I'm challenging you, if you're going through this hard time in your life, and you need deliverance, whether God delivers you or not, doesn't change who God is. But He can. And going back to Ephesians, who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, God absolutely can. Are you trusting in that God? We have problems, absolutely. Some of the problems are there for no other reason than to bring Him glory. What's Paul say? Paul says He has a thorn in the flesh that He's prayed out to God over and over and over again. But God has left it there for Him. He's given it to him for God's glory. Sometimes we have those. Other times we have problems because of character flaws that we all do where we, we need to grow in it, where our own decisions are reaping us consequences. God's there to help us grow. If you're facing this battle, if you're facing this battle, 
cry out to a God of deliverance. That's my thing. That's my answer to you. Cry out to a God of deliverance. You pick up. You pick that up. Verse chapter 16. Ephesians 6, 13. Ephesians 6, 16, I'm sorry. Take up the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation. That is what you need. How about this one? But I don't know what to say. Well, take up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Take up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Ephesians 4.25 says this, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. There are times in lives that we just don't know what to say, right? God, I don't know if I can be used by you. I never know what to say to people. People are hurting. I just don't know what to tell them. Well, Paul says this, Speak the truth. That's always a good place to start, right? Speak the truth. You say, well, what truth do I speak? I don't know theology, pastor. I don't know doctrine. I don't understand those type of things. Well, let's back up here just a minute. Let's look at Romans 12. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Now, that's pretty, pretty easy instructions right there, isn't it? And I would say that's a great place to start. If you don't know what to say... I would say this. You know what? There's people here today who are just rejoicing because of things in their life. And there are others today who are weeping because of things in their life. And somebody may say to you, you know, well, Pastor, I never hear about those things. Everybody I talk to always seems fine. They, I ask them, how are you doing? They say, fine. Okay. So maybe challenge them a little bit. Speak the truth a little bit. Say, okay, is that fine? Is in, yeah, everything's great. Or is that fine? Is in, well, that's just the bad answer, even though my life is falling apart. Because we give those church answers sometimes. But if somebody challenges you, you say, well, that's, I'm feeling fine today. Okay, yeah, well, there are times in my life when I'm feeling fine when really I'm not. Is that where you are today or you really are feeling fine? Which one is it? Push them a little bit. And then rejoice if you need to rejoice. Weep if you need to weep. Because here's the thing. You've heard this before. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's a great place to start. Once they know how much you care, then speaking the truth comes much easier. But it just begins with just empathizing a little bit, living life just a little bit. This battle, I don't know what to say. Well, God says, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Well, here's another one. This one doesn't have a piece of armor, but it's another battle that's addressed right after this. I feel like my time has passed. My answer to you is this. It's pray. There are some of us here in this church that we just wonder, God, I, I don't think you're going to be able to use me anymore. There was a time in my own life when I almost walked away from ministry. I thought my time was past. I thought God had used me and I was done. What do you do in those times when you feel like, you know what, God, there's nothing else you've got for me? I would say pray. Ephesians 6, 18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Every single one of us can pray. Every single one of us. First Thessalonians says this, pray without ceasing. We all have this call. Every single one of us can pray. So there's one of you sitting here today and you're thinking, you know what, Pastor, I just can't do anything. I'm not physically able or I'm, I'm just, nobody really likes me to be involved in anything. Well, you know what? We can all pray. Every one of us can do that. These are things we can all do. So what? In the end, so what? What do we do? As we close this series on Ephesians, what do we do? What do we learn? Well, we learn we're all going to face battles. God's going to want us to doubt our position in Him. God's not. Satan's going to want us to doubt our position in God. Okay? That's what's going to happen, all right? Satan's going to want us to doubt our position in God. Those things happen. Satan's going to want us to begin to focus on our condition, which is completely broken. And as we focus on our condition, which is broken, then we begin to wonder even more about our position because, God, I'm broken. I'm not good enough. I can't do this. How could you even love me? How could you save me? I'm a broken person. Satan's going to want to doubt, cause you to doubt that. You are going to face battles. All the time you're going to face battles. These are things that's true. But God has equipped you. He's equipped you to handle these battles. This armor of God that he has. We've got the truth we know what the truth is. We have faith. All of these things we have. Are we willing to put these things on? God has equipped us to handle these battles. But in all of it, and I think if there's a key out of Ephesians that I want to remind you, this key is this. Is that your condition can never change your position. Who I am as a person will never change who I am in God's family. 
my actions as a Christian have consequences. Absolutely, we're going to talk about this in cynical in just a few minutes. There are going to be some consequences to my actions as a believer. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 says, I'm going to receive payment for those things I do, both good and evil. There will be a payment for the good things. There will be a payment for the evil things that I do as a Christian. But that does not change the fact that I am now born of God. And James says that very same thing, that I'm now born of God. I have God's DNA within me. That does not change. My children can displease me. We can break the fellowship, but they will always be my children. I cannot change their DNA, and I cannot, can, I cannot change my spiritual DNA through my own actions. I can't. Because God has literally rewired me spiritually. When I place my faith in Christ, my position has completely changed. My condition can never, ever change that. But my position can change my condition. And if there's anything to know in our lives, that my position in Christ can change my condition. So the final battle cry, the cry is this. If this is the last generation that lives on this earth, will we be the last of the Ephesians? Will we be the church that Paul is writing to here, the church that live in unity of love, unity bound together by Christ through faith? Will we be that church? Will we be the church loving on one another, forgiving one another, submitting to one another? Will we be the church putting on the armor of God? Will we be the church of husbands being servant leaders for the wise, wives being helpers to their husbands, children obeying their parents, fathers not frustrating their kids? Will we be those people? Will we be that church? Will we be the last of the Ephesians? God, we come to you today, Lord, and there's these battles that we're facing. And Father, I don't know what battles people here are facing, what individual ones they're going through. Father, I don't know. But God, you do. You know. And I pray that maybe you would help them as they, as they wrestle with this, realizing they're really wrestling against Satan, not against flesh and blood, but against Satan and the rulers of the darkness. Father, help us all as we go out into this world. We are going to fight this week and next week. And all the weeks following, and Lord, I pray that we would stay strong, that we would put on the different pieces of armor, God, that we put them all on, and that we would wear them well, and that we would never let Satan get a foothold in our lives, that we would stand, stand strong in your might. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.